SpaceX's Falcon 9 suffers its first mission anomaly in over 300 missions, Europe's new rocket had a very successful first flight, if you don't pay attention to what happened later in the mission, and India sends astronauts to the US to prepare for a flight to the ISS. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 12th of July, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Imagine spending more than a year in a roughly 160 square meter or 1700 square foot space with three others and no direct contact with your friends and family. Would you do it? Well, this is exactly what the crew of NASA's first CHIPIA mission did. CHIPIA is short for Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog, and the program consists of three one-year simulated Mars missions. The first of these ended after 378 days on July 6th, when NASA astronaut Chell Lindgren knocked on the door of the habitat and welcomed the crew of four back to Earth. The crew consisted of Commander Kelly Haston, Flight Engineer Ross Brockwell, Medical Officer Nathan Jones, and Science Officer Anka Salariu. They spent a year inside of a 3D printed simulated Mars habitat named Mars Dune Alpha, located at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Throughout the year, the crew performed Mars walks and robotic operations, they maintained the habitat, exercised, and grew crops, all while being isolated from the rest of Earth, confined in a small space with limited resources and food supplies. NASA even simulated a realistic communications delay, so the crew, if they asked a question, would have to wait at least 44 minutes for the reply to come back. You can't really have a normal conversation with a delay like that. These are just some of the challenges that the agency will face for a crewed mission to the Red Planet. So, a simulation like this helps NASA to understand how living on another planet affects the crew's health and their performance. While the first CHIPIA mission is now over, the crew can't return home just yet as they need to perform post-mission checkups and data collection for two weeks. The next CHIPIA mission is set to begin in 2025 and will be nearly identical. This will allow the researchers to collect data from more participants and to gain a broader insight into how a mission to Mars might affect the crew. After a long wait, Europe's newest rocket, Ariane 6, finally lifted off for the first time. The rocket replaces the Ariane 5, which flew for the last time over a year ago. Ariane 6's maiden flight was mostly successful, but more about that later. Let's start off at the beginning. Liftoff of Ariane 6 occurred on July 9th at 1900 UTC, one hour into the four-hour launch window. A few seconds before liftoff, the rocket's hydrogen-powered Vulcan 2.1 engine roared to life. Then at T-0, the two solid rocket boosters ignited, and the rocket leapt off the pad at the Guiana Space Center in Kourou, French Guiana. The countdown up to this point proceeded smoothly without any issues or delays. The rocket also launched on its first attempt, which is great for a first flight. Just like the countdown, the flight up was also very clean and hit one milestone after another, eventually inserting its upper stage with its payloads into orbit. This demo flight carried 11 passengers, consisting of CubeSats from several universities and other customers, including NASA, as well as a few additional small experiments and two re-entry capsules designed to test heat shields. Most of these payloads were successfully deployed once Ariane 6 reached orbit. But then, things didn't exactly go as planned. An important new feature of Ariane 6 is its capability to ignite the second stage multiple times. This allows the rocket to perform complex missions, but also to deorbit the upper stage in order to prevent space debris. To do this, the stage features auxiliary propulsion units, or APUs, that pressurize the tanks and provide additional thrust if needed. The first APU successfully lit up during ascent, but when the upper stage ignited for the second time, the APU shut down almost immediately. Because of this, the rocket failed to follow its planned trajectory and couldn't ignite a third time for a deorbit burn. Instead, the upper stage automatically executed its passivation procedure, which means it is now an uncontrolled piece of space debris that will remain in space until its orbit decays naturally. Those two re-entry capsules were also originally set to deploy after this deorbit burn, but instead stayed attached to the rocket to prevent additional space debris. While all of this means that Ariane 6 was not able to demonstrate one of its major features, the first few launches on the rocket's manifest don't require the second stage to restart. ESA and Ariane Space are therefore pretty happy with the mission's outcome and consider the flight a great success. And just on a personal touch, it was a, a bit strange because I have had the feeling that it was even easier than on Ariane 5. So <laughs> it was not something I expected, but the chronology 
uh, I have made a lot of chronology and it was one of the most easy chronology. It's amazing that for our first uh, launch, uh, things have been uh, so smooth and so easy. So congratulations. We do hope that they're able to fix the APU soon, but at the end of the day, ESA now has a replacement for the Ariane 5. So congratulations to ESA and Ariane Space on this mostly successful flight. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency's SLIM mission is now officially over. This week, the agency wrapped up the mission by disbanding the team and throwing a party to celebrate the mission. We followed the mission in previous episodes, but if you don't remember, let's quickly recap. SLIM, which stands for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, was launched in September of last year and landed on the moon in January. Unfortunately, the landing didn't go exactly as planned. SLIM was supposed to land on its side, but after the nozzle fell off one of the engines, it landed upside down instead. Now, Surprisingly, the mission didn't end there. While the lander's solar panel wasn't in its optimal orientation, it still caught some light at the end of the lunar day, just enough for SLIM to operate for a few Earth days. The lander used its spectroscopic camera to observe some surrounding rocks, which researchers then named after dogs. Even more surprisingly, SLIM also survived its first few lunar nights. The spacecraft was never designed to deal with the harsh temperature swings that those bring, but it still woke up as soon as its solar panels generated enough power. SLIM amazingly managed to survive three lunar nights and had its final communication with Earth in late April. JAXA hasn't heard from the lander since then, and with the team disbanded, the mission is now truly over. That said, it's definitely safe to say that the mission was a great success, despite the somewhat unusual landing. SLIM has delivered much more science than originally planned, and it survived for much longer than expected. Now that is an achievement worth celebrating. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, announced that it has selected two astronauts to undergo training at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Just who those two astronauts are has not yet been announced, but they're among the first four Indian astronauts whose names were made public back in February. One of the two will fly to the ISS on the Axiom 4 mission, which is currently planned for no earlier than October of this year. This mission will help to prepare India's astronauts for their human spaceflight missions on board the country's upcoming Gaganyaan spacecraft. The first crewed mission is currently scheduled for next year. ISRO has also proposed an uncrewed resupply mission to the ISS using a slightly larger version of the Gaganyaan spacecraft. If the ISS partners agree with this mission, it will most likely happen near the end of the decade. And speaking of Axiom Space, the company has contracted Gravitix to build a spacecraft for its upcoming commercial space station, the first module of which is scheduled to launch in 2026. It'll attach to the ISS while the station is being assembled and separate before the ISS is retired. The new spacecraft is set to have a diameter of 4 meters, which is similar to the modules that are currently being built for the Axiom station. The exact function of the new spacecraft is still unclear, but according to Gravitix, it'll play a utility role and be capable of providing various services while attached to the commercial space station. Now, while this could mean anything, it's worth noting that Gravitix specializes in space station modules, so it might be something more permanent. NASA and Boeing provided a progress update on Starliner Calypso. A few weeks ago, the return of the capsule and NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams was delayed indefinitely to allow Boeing to further research some issues with the capsule's reaction control system thrusters. Some of these thrusters experienced issues on the way up to the space station, and Boeing had to disable up to five of them. The company has since been trying to replicate these issues at a test facility at White Sands, New Mexico. And hey, fun fact, the space shuttle's reaction control system was also tested there. Well, so far, these tests have not led to any conclusions, but Boeing plans to perform more tests to narrow down the cause of the issues. Until then, Starliner is cleared for an emergency return, but we hope that won't be necessary. Butch and Sonny explained during a press briefing that they are still very confident in the Starliner's capability to return safely as it was very responsive on the way to the space station despite the thruster issues. A Polish rocket reached space for the first time! The suborbital rocket lifted off from the Andoya Space Center in Norway on July 3rd, and this week it was announced that the flight reached an altitude of 101 kilometers. That is just above the internationally recognized edge of space. The rocket was developed by the Łukasiewicz Institute of Aviation in Warsaw, and it has a hybrid first stage that uses hydrogen peroxide as oxidizer. Next, the Institute hopes to fly customer payloads too. While this was only a suborbital flight, it's still really cool to see countries reach space all on their own. 
The Active Debris Removal by Astroscale Japan, or Address J, satellite, aborted a fly-around maneuver of a piece of space debris, a dead upper stage from a Japanese H-2A rocket launched many years ago. Now, you might remember that Address J was launched on an electron rocket back in February for JAXA's Commercial Removal of Debris Demonstration Program, and it performed observations in close proximity to the rocket stage. We covered this in an episode just last month. Well, this time, the spacecraft was supposed to fly around the space debris at a distance of 50 meters and gather images to assess its condition. However, after completing about one-third of the maneuver, an automated abort was triggered by the satellite's collision avoidance system, causing Address J to move away from the rocket stage. Now, don't be mistaken, this is a lot harder than it may sound, considering that the dead rocket stage wasn't prepared for this at all. The stage has no hardware for rendezvous and is now essentially an uncontrolled city bus-sized chunk of debris. But fortunately, Address J is now safe and in good condition. Astroscale is now preparing to approach the rocket stage again and to retry the maneuver. Now let's go over all of the traffic in space during the past week and then we'll see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off the week, we had a Falcon 9 launch on July 8th carrying the Turksat 6A communication satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. The launch was notable as this is the first satellite fully developed and built in Turkey. The satellite will offer data relay for civilian and military communications, covering its home country as well as most of Europe, the Middle East, and Western Russia. Turksat 6A was launched atop booster B-1076 from Florida. The booster ended its 15th flight by touching down on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. When the drone ship came back to Port Canaveral, it became clear that the booster landed far from the center and had a slight lean. But nonetheless, the booster is back in port, so the landing and the recovery were successful. Later in the week, we saw the failure of iSpace's Hyperbola-1 rocket. The all-solid rocket lifted off from the Jochuan Satellite Launch Center in China on July 10th at 2340 UTC. It was supposed to carry three weather satellites into sun-synchronous orbit, but failed after an anomaly occurred in the rocket's fourth stage. With Hyperbola 1's first flight in 2019, iSpace became the first private Chinese company to reach orbit. However, that success didn't last long, as four of the rocket's seven have failed. With the investigation into the latest anomaly underway, we'll have to wait and see what's next for iSpace. And to wrap up the week, we had a Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg taking place on July 12th at 2.35 UTC. The rocket was carrying a batch of 13 Starlink direct-to-cell satellites and 7 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. While the first stage, B-1063, completed its 19th launch and landing, which took place on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, the second stage did not have the same luck. About two minutes after MVAC ignition, SpaceX's feed showed ice building up on the insulation surrounding the upper stage engine. This buildup continued alongside what appeared to be streaks of some sort of liquid. Now, of the potential liquids on board Falcon 9's second stage, this looked a lot like liquid oxygen. We've seen something similar in the past from the MVAC engine's bleed line, which we can regularly see venting on every mission. This liquid oxygen then often partially turns into a solid, and the solid oxygen builds up into a blob. It's always kind of funny to see it fly by when the engine then relights and the blob is burned by the exhaust. However, this was different. Not the right location, and definitely not the right amount. You can see lots of ice building up versus what we normally see, which is just a small chunk or blob of solid oxygen. Despite this, the second stage engine completed its initial ascent and inserted itself and the Starlink satellites into their usual preliminary orbit. This is always followed by a second engine ignition that then circularizes the orbit and puts the Starlinks into their proper deployment orbit. Then from there, they usually take a few months to raise their orbits to operational altitude. Well, after waiting for a while for confirmation of this circularization and deployment from SpaceX, Elon confirmed on social media that the engine had suffered a RUD, which stands for Rapid Unscheduled Disassembly, when it attempted to relight. He also mentioned that teams will be looking through the data, which means it'll take some time until we get a full picture out of this incident. SpaceX then officially posted a statement confirming the second stage relight issue and that the satellites were deployed into a lower than intended orbit. The Post also said the company was able to contact five of the 20 satellites and was attempting to make them raise their orbits. Now, this is not an easy task, as Starlink satellites use Hall Effect thrusters, which are highly efficient but very low on thrust. If the satellites are left in a really low orbit, the thrusters just can't compensate for the drag caused by Earth's atmosphere. This is currently a developing situation, and more information will probably come out between our time of recording and time of publication, so don't be surprised if we miss some of that. 
Of course, this will be front and center on our weekly Flame Trench live show. So be sure to tune into that for more information and some spicy debates. And predictably, more information did release during the production of this video, and the Federal Aviation Administration, which licenses commercial launches in the US, has deemed that a mishap investigation is required as a result of this anomaly. They will be involved with every step of the process and must approve SpaceX's final report, including any corrective actions. This was Falcon 9's 353rd orbital flight overall and the 69th of the year. Given SpaceX's confirmation of lower than intended orbit, it appears that this breaks the company's streak of successful Falcon missions since the previous unsuccessful mission, which was Amos 6. That streak ended earlier this week with the successful launch of Turksat 6A at 334. So here's hoping SpaceX's team can quickly go through all the data, set a fix in place, and come back to not just reach that record again, but to beat it. With this launch, SpaceX has launched a total of 6,738 Starlink satellites into orbit, and we may have to check back next week as to how many in total will have re-entered based on the outcome of this mission. After staying at the International Space Station for five and a half months, the Cygnus NG-20 spacecraft departed from the orbiting outpost this morning. This Cygnus, named SS Patricia Robertson, was launched atop a Falcon 9 in January and brought over 3,700 kilograms of supplies to the space station. Its final task is now taking out the trash and testing a thermal protection system as it burns up in the atmosphere during re-entry, which is scheduled for tomorrow, July 13th. Going into next week, we were supposed to have three Falcon 9 launches, but based on the issue on the Starlink Group 9-3 mission, we currently don't know what the future launch schedule will look like for the company's workhorse rocket. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.